It's lovely to be back down here in Hobart again uh, for this colloquium, which is becoming a bit of a tradition for me to come down every year. It's a good excuse uh, to leave Queensland in the winter and come down to Tasmania in the winter. <laughs> Mike, Mike I, I, brought all, I brought my family with me and they'd never seen snow before, so uh, they saw snow two days ago and it was very exciting, so it was worth it for them. So one of the things, one of the themes uh, that's come up already this morning is this idea of objective reality. And it always makes me think that we just need to keep on reading C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, over and over and over again. Uh, because I don't think anything will be said today that in one sense hasn't been said already by other people, which is obvious, but in particular when it comes to this idea of objective reality, Lewis is very short, not that accessible, but absolutely worth reading uh, and memorising book, The Abolition of Man, says it really, really well. One of the uh, authors that C.S. Lewis was highly influenced by was G.K. Chesterton, uh, and it's with him that I want to start my talk this morning. In the third chapter of Orthodoxy, G.K. Chesterton provides one of my favourites of his longer quotes. Like most Chesterton, it is prophetic, and its prophetic prescience speaks not only to his time, but to ours as well. He's writing about a form of scepticism due to what he calls the suicide of thought, a way of thinking that cancels out all other thinking. This is a shortened version of what he says. The new rebel is a sceptic and will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never really be a revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts everything really gets in the way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind, and the modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. As a politician, he will cry out that war is a waste of life, and then as a philosopher that all life is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant and then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. <laughs> if you've not read Chesterton before, you do yourself a favour, he's amazing. The man of this school first goes to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if they were beasts. Then he takes his hat and umbrella and goes on to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beasts. In his book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he has lost his right to rebel against anything. Such is Chesterton's prophetic insight that this passage applies equally today to what this colloquium has called wokery. There is a deep incoherence at the heart of wokery a dismantling and deconstructing anti-authoritarian, anti-essentialist approach to reality that, as Chesterton says, undermines its own minds. I believe that this incoherence presents one of the keys to combating the movement, but only if we are not participants in incoherence ourselves. As always, we must begin with definitions. But before I can, I have to admit that personally, woke is not a word that I use very often. I think its connotations are too complicated and it holds a series of connections and allegiances that often do damage to the causes of people who invoke it. The word is almost exclusively used by people who are against it. It's used as a pejorative. The woke don't use the word to describe themselves. Rather, they talk about being inclusive and caring, empathetic, self-aware and anti-racist. And I have to be honest, I think that for a lot of them, that is truly their desire, and it comes from a noble place, which is a point that I will return to later. So how should we define this word? In many ways, it operates as a placeholder for a raft of socially progressive ideas and policies that are rejected by many on the broadly defined right, but more specifically by conservatives and perhaps some liberals. The reasons for this rejection are not single-faceted. Some reject it because it is often anti-liberal, such as by compelling speech. This is what initially shot Jordan Peterson into fame, his rejection of Bill C-16 in Canada that compelled certain speech with regards to gender pronouns. Others reject this so-called social progress because they see it as a thinly veiled reimagining of Marxism. 
and they are historically aware enough to know that this ideology has literally never ended well. There are others, again, who reject what they call the woke movement because they can see the damage that it is doing to people, particularly to young people. And then there are others, again, who suggest it is ultimately anti-humanist and perhaps even anti-Christ. These are all fine reasons for rejecting wokery. <clears throat> I would argue, though, that they're not necessarily fine reasons for using the word. And it should be used thoughtfully because throwing it around is like a red rag to a bull. If you're trying to get an, a reaction, go for it. But getting emotional reactions is not the same as presenting winning, compelling and winsome arguments. While I generally accept the above variations of the definition, I want to add to it a broader definition that speaks to its foundation. Today I want to propose that at the heart of the woke movement is a self-sabotaging suicide of thought. But not only of thought, but also of reason and communication of coherence itself. This is why I've called my talk this morning The Incoherence of Babel, because incoherence forms the foundation of the woke movement. This is an incoherence that is becoming so obvious that it can no longer be ignored, though I believe it has a long heritage, and understanding this heritage is fundamental to knowing what to do about it. I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of Babel that comes from Genesis 11. Humanity comes together to build a tower to reach heaven, and it ends with their language being confused. C.S. Lewis employs this imagery in the dystopian vision of That Hideous Strength, which is a much underread third book on, uh, in the Ransom Trilogy. In this book, a group of progressives, calling themselves the National Institute of Coordinated Experiment, or the NICE, attempts to bring about a new order of humanity. I don't want to spoil the book for anyone who hasn't read it, and I do recommend it, but one of the results of this Babel-like attempt is that their language becomes confused and they're subjected to the violent chaos that results from incoherent babel. The goal of the NICE is to become the new gods of a new world. There is at one point a brilliant summation of the processes at work in their minds. This is what Lewis says. Despair of objective truth had been increasingly insinuated into the scientists' indifference to it and a concentration upon power had been the result. Dreams of the far future destiny of man were dragging up from its shallow and unquiet grave the old dream of man as God. What should they find incredible since they believed no longer in a rational universe? What should they regard as too obscene since they held that all morality was a mere subjective byproduct of the physical and economic situations of men? There was now at last a real chance for fallen man to shake off that limitation of his powers which mercy had imposed upon him as a protection from the full results of his fall. If this succeeded, hell would be at last incarnate. C.S. Lewis, like Chesterton, is prophetic. The clues to the babble of wokery are all in this passage. Despair of objective truth, a concentration upon power, the old dream of man as God. What could be too obscene in the moral vacuum of a purely subjective world? And indeed, in our own world, are not everyday new obscenities being codified, academicised, covered in media spin, and then accepted as not only not obscene, but actually held up as beautiful and good? But the result and the price of these animating desires is incoherence. And that, I believe, is the key to recognising the problem, the key to disarming it, and the key to responding to it. Focusing on coherence helps to understand exactly what has been undermined in the modern West. If we focus on the issues and not individuals, we can have some modicum of success. But this is a little bit like putting out spot fires with our shoes while a bushfire ravages the land. We should attack it at first principles, because at first principles, Wokery fails miserably. Perhaps it's now incumbent on me to prove that the woke movement is, in fact, incoherent. Let me do so by attempting to reimagine the Chesterton passage that I quoted earlier, adapting it to our modern world in 2023. The new intellectual is woke and will only trust his feelings. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never enjoy real community. And the fact that he doubts everything would reveal his inconsistency if anyone thought consistently. 
As a politician, in one chamber, he will cry that we must save the environment for future generations, and in another, he'll legislate the destruction of those generations before they're born. As a female CEO, she'll praise the advantages of a boardroom with more women than men, and then, as an enlightened progressive, she'll suggest that women basically are men. As a firm supporter of women's professional sporting teams, he'll fight for those teams to be filled with biological males. As a state party leader, he'll advocate for women's rights while ejecting women from his party who advocate for women's existence. On his Twitter account, he'll celebrate modern sexual freedom so that people can date whoever they're physically attracted to before attacking comments on a previous ally as transphobic because they're not physically attracted to a trans person. The modern universities believe their job is to listen to students rather than for students to listen to them, and in the name of learning, they cancel anyone from whom they might actually learn. Therefore, the modern man obsessed with deconstruction has become practically useless for all purposes of constructive conversation. By asserting the incoherence of everything, he has become incoherent to everyone, even himself. Like Chesterton skeptic and C.S. Lewis's NICE, woke incoherence emerges from a hatred of limitations. In the pursuit of freedom, humanity follows a spiraling tendency to reject the limitations of being human, those tyrannies of biology, of sexual reproduction, of the family. In short, the tyranny of reality. For the sake of progress, this tyranny must be rejected. We must assert our power to redefine reality as we see fit. Because if there is any kind of objective reality that we did not determine, then we are not in control. Objective order necessarily comes from outside of ourselves. That we are created beings subject to a creator within a created order is the greatest of heresies for the orthodox progressive. Created order must be rejected. But the cost of this rejection is the loss of order itself, and hence the slide into incoherence. Order is logical, coherent, and meaningful. Each of these words could be subsumed into an ancient concept that has its roots in Greek philosophy and the fathers of the church, a concept upon which Western civilization was built and the rejection of which is the reason for its collapse, the logos. Professor Peter Kreeft has explained the complexity and the breadth of meaning that this term encompasses. One of the ways that he explains it is that the Logos is the ultimate truth about the nature of all things. He then proposes a tripartite way of thinking about Logos, essentially that there are three forms of Logos that all equally represent the fullness of its meaning. While the word has dozens of meanings, they can all fit under three headings metaphysical, psychological, and linguistic. Firstly, the metaphysical realm of Logos includes meanings like realness, order, truth, and meaning. The second umbrella term is the psychological, and it includes terms like wisdom, understanding, reason, and logic. This is, as Kreeft explains, the human psychological internalization of the first Logos, the metaphysical Logos, which is out there. The third part then is the communi communicative or spoken externalization of the psychological. And this is the linguistic and its definitions include words, language, speech, communication, explanation. So there is a clear connection between these three logoi. As he says, logos number three is a mind's externalization of logos number two, which is a mind's internalization of logos number one. That is, the linguistic is the mind's externalization of the psychological, which is the mind's internalization of the metaphysical. How are we going? Is that okay? <laughs> After this explanation, Kreef goes on to explain that the whole history of philosophy has been structured around the dismissal and the denial of these three realities. This is what he says. Pre-modern philosophy, ancient and medieval, centred on metaphysics and ended with the nominalism of William of Ockham, which was a denial of Logos number one, intelligible universals. Then classical modern philosophy, beginning with Descartes and Bacon, centred on epistemology and ended in the empiricism, uh, empiricist scepticism of Hume and the even more radical scepticism of Kant, 
who denied that anyone could ever know things as they are in themselves. In other words, objective reality. Finally, 20th century philosophy concentrated on philosophy of language and culminated in deconstructionism, which is the denial of Logos number three, the denial that words can tell truths. <clears throat> this, according to Kreeft, and who am I to disagree with Peter Kreeft, is the history of philosophy, the gradual denial of Logos, which of course has coincided with the gradual denial of the reality of Christ, and with it, the denial of any kind of reality at all. We, <clears throat> uh, Kreeft writes that our world is shaped by these three ideas. Firstly, there is no intelligible reality, no order and meaning to reality. Secondly, even if there were, it could never be known, never understood. And thirdly, even if anyone did understand it, it could never be communicated. Now, I believe that today we're faced significantly with the obviousness of the linguistic denial. We have pulled apart words and meaning itself is beginning to fray. This is in part the result of a process of deconstruction propelled by members of the Frankfurt School. And I assume from looking at the program today that both Kevin and Sarah will speak a little bit about this. Kevin, I know, Kevin Donnelly that is, discusses these topics at length and his work in publishing reminders about the Marxist foundations of woke ideas is important and it's needed. So I'm in no way criticising this approach. I agree with it. However, it alone is not enough. Unfortunately, it is simply not sufficient to point out logically, cohesively and coherently where the origins of the radical left lie and what damage these ideologies have done over time. Again, this is not to criticise these efforts, but unfortunately, it's not sufficient because logical, cohesive and coherent arguments are like water off a duck's back to those that have swallowed the linguistic logos denial. I'm sure you've all wondered at this, how people seem to be so recalcitrant in the face of clear and articulate logic. It's because they don't believe in it. The incoherence of Babel relies upon the denial of meaning, which rests upon the denial of order. When Friedrich Nietzsche wrote of the madman proclaiming the death of God, he was right to say, my time has not yet come because the people surrounding him in the town square in the parable had not grappled with the gravity of the implications of murdering God. God had been slowly dying since the unintended revolutions of the metaphysical and psychological denials. Nietzsche knew that his society was living on borrowed time. He knew that meaning had died, while those around him still held on to the vestiges of meaning and purpose that only come from submitting to the created order. It was not until that final denial, the very recent death of communication itself, what we might call, to use Roland Barthes' words, the death of the author, that the impact of those two other deaths, the metaphysical and the psychological, has started to be felt. And that is what we are feeling now. Wokery is predicated upon the denial of logocentricism. In, in this, it is certainly built upon the work of the Frankfurt School, and the cultural Marxism that emerged from that movement. However, as I suggested already, we should be careful with our language when invoking the shadow of these ideas to explain the woke movement. We cannot commit logical fallacies and we must be careful to avoid straw men. While the looming figure of Marx is certainly responsible for elements of cultural Marxism, he himself was not a cultural Marxist. He was a proper Marxist. And quite likely, Marx would have actually disavowed this movement. It must also be recognised that most of today's so-called cultural Marxists, certainly most of those under 40 years old who tend to be the loudest, have not read any Marx. <laughs> the average woke militant today is an accidental cultural Marxist. All young people know is that <laughs> feelings, not facts, are sovereign and that oppression is bad. I think that rather than foisting definitions upon others, which they then can honestly and ignorantly deny, we should take them seriously when they define themselves. So in the name of doing just that, I offer a definition of the word woke by a man named Adam Vasco, who on his LinkedIn is described as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion in Professional Practice. <laughs> that's a job these days, that's cool. And I, I think that, all jokes aside, this is a definition that we should take seriously. 
because this is his own definition. He writes this. There's a phenomenon afoot in social discourse, a peculiar inversion of language where the term woke has been repurposed as an insult. It is a pointed dart flung with derision meant to stigmatise those committed to awareness, understanding and activism around social issues such as racism, inequality and injustice. And yet, when faced with this misguided weaponisation of language, I suggest we embrace it, smile and simply say thank you. The word has been co-opted and leveraged as a pejorative, a signal to marginalise and ridicule those who believe in the necessity of societal change. The term woke is brandished like an emblem of shame, a scarlet letter for the socially conscious. Consider this, however. If being woke means standing up against bigotry, advocating for equality, challenging ingrained societal norms that perpetuate injustice, then we should not only accept this label, but wear it with pride. Critics would say that being woke is a form of virtue signaling, a way of projecting moral superiority without the need for substantive action. They may argue that it's a superficial gloss on deep-seated and complex issues. But in the face of such criticism, it's important to remember that awareness is the first step toward change. Recognising and naming a problem is a crucial part of the process of addressing it. Being woke is not about being self-righteous or divisive. It's about being conscious, compassionate and committed to change. Embrace it, champion it, and use it as a tool for awareness, understanding, and activism." End quote. Now, I'm not sure that you all necessarily agree with what I'm about to say, but I have to admit that if this is what woke means, if this is what it really means, and if it only means this and nothing more than this, I really don't have a problem with it. On this definition, some of my heroes are woke. William Wilberforce, St Thomas More, Martin Luther King Jr., even Jesus himself was woke under this definition. As Vasco says, if being woke means standing up against bigotry, advocating for equality, challenging ingrained societal norms that perpetuate injustice, then we should not only accept this label but wear it with pride. I couldn't agree more. But perhaps before I do agree more, I might ask a few important questions. I might ask the definition of some of the words. What exactly does bigotry mean? What about equality or injustice? The fact is that it is not standing up against injustice that we disagree about. I too believe in standing up against injustice. What we disagree about is the definition of words. And this is why understanding the denial of the logos is so important when considering how to deal with the negative elements of the woke movement. More than ever, words have slippery meanings. Just consider all the recent examples of elected officials and judges struggling to define what a woman is. So this is the first place that I might end up disagreeing with Vasco, the definition of words. And then after that comes the just as important question of what steps are justifiable to take in the process of standing up against injustice. In the wise words of our namesake, Christopher Dawson, as soon as men decide that all means are permitted to fight an evil, then their good becomes indistinguishable from the evil that they set out to destroy. Isn't that the perfect summation of the woke movement? In the name of tolerance, they become intolerant. In the name of freedom, they suppress freedoms. In the name of some human rights, they eradicate others. This is yet another example of the incoherence at the heart of modernity. And this is why being woke Despite Vasco's claims that it is not mere virtue signalling or a way of projecting moral superiority without the need for substantive action, so easily does become exactly that. The evidence would suggest that Vasco is wrong when he says being woke is not about being self-righteous or divisive. This wokery is not only the concern for imbalance for power, of power, but even more so it is the desire to be seen as caring. But there are th two things at work here, obviously. There's firstly the actual caring, and secondly, the being seen. The desire to be seen often outstrips the actual care by magnitudes. How do we know this? Because none of our political parties, except perhaps for the Greens, and even then probably not, are truly wedded to the kind of Marxist concern for power imbalances that have shaped the pol political culture that they have inherited. Because they are the power. 
It's very difficult for powerful people to be properly Marxist in the genuine sense, because as soon as they gain power to make the change, they become the problem. And thus, virtue signaling concern for people becomes the most important element, because it takes away the focus from the fact that the virtue signaler has, in fact, amassed for themselves significant power. Powerless people aren't interested in signaling. They're too busy trying to survive. So if the question today is what to do about the woke movement, it is in some ways a question of what should be asserted in its place. My question is, or my suggestion is, that it cannot simply be to rewind the clock to some recent apparent golden age. We did not start to go wrong just because of the postmodern turn. This is not just a problem of Marxism. And it cannot be a return even to modernism. What is required is a return to reality a full return to the Logos. And this is because we cannot replace the incoherence of wokery with just some other form of incoherence. This is a genuine concern, I think, that we should have. Because those who combat the woke movement today must ensure that they're not actually just reacting and not unconsciously saying, we don't like this particular incoherence because we're not in control of it. How close we ourselves come to entertaining the power dynamics of Marxism if we only get upset when our control and power is threatened. We cannot believe truth and goodness are on our sides if we only reject things that we just so happen not to like. So what then is a solution? I've described this morning that not just wokery but modernity itself is predicated upon the denial of the Logos. I've also made the claim that incoherence is not a persuasive argument for people who don't believe that anything even is coherent. Logic, rationality and common sense will not win the day if the day does not care for these things. How can we combat the intolerance of people who truly believe that they're fighting for tolerance? In the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, it's a universal law. Intolerance is the first sign of an inadequate education. An ill-educated person behaves with arrogant impatience, whereas truly profound education breeds humility. Humility must be part of the character of the solution. I believe, and there shouldn't be any surprises here, that education is the answer. Education is where the rejection of the linguistic logos has taken its deepest root. Karina talked about that before in mentioning how dire things have gotten in the English curriculum. And this is why the loudest, proudest and most combative, but also the most well-intentioned and unaware of woke people are often young people. The 40-year process of ceding power and influence in the education sector to the left was one of the most damaging and foolish things that the people on the side of the Logos could ever have allowed. But it is not a lost cause. The beauty of education is it gets a fresh start every year. It starts with children. And despite what we're told, children naturally believe in reality. We're naturally logocentric beings and we actually need to be taught, or you could say indoctrinated, to believe that reality isn't real. Nature is on the side of reality and reality is on the side of the logos. Every young child learning to speak and read presents the possibility of a return to sanity, meaning and purpose. We must teach coherence. Real education which best emerges from a classical liberal approach, can reveal the sham that lies at the heart of the woke movement. I do want to take the opportunity to put the situation as bluntly as possible. Catholic and independent schools are failing at this. They're not necessarily failing at producing decent and acceptably well-adjusted citizens who have a modicum of faith or at least interest in Jesus. But not only is this not enough, but at everything that I just mentioned should rest primarily with the family and the church, not the school. The school's task is to teach students how to think and speak well. This means bringing them into harmony with the metaphysical, the psychological and the linguistic. In doing this, we naturally teach the reality of the Logos. Classical education is not predicated primarily on being anti-woke. It's not interested in those terms. Those terms didn't exist in the classical era. However, it will, by default, address the woke issue as young people are taught to seek the good, the true and the beautiful, to seek the logos and communicate about it effectively. Our proposed new school in Brisbane 
the, one of the schools I'm working with, is named after St John Henry Newman. And his vision of education addresses these issues without needing to throw stones or build straw men. As he says, this is an education which gives a man a clear, conscious view of their own opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them, an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them. It teaches him to see things as they are, to go right to the point, to disentangle the skein of thought, to detect what is sophistical, and to discard what is irrelevant. This education, classical education, is the remedy for the incoherence of Babel. Thank you.